Good morning. I think we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Christopher Collins, and I want to welcome you to the 2023 Columbia University School of Professional Studies American Language Program Winter Conference. Um, this year's event will be our ninth conference. Um, each year we've had a different theme and have had a plenary presentation followed by shorter presentations pertaining to the theme. Uh, last year we held our conference remotely and Scott Thornberry joined us from Barcelona to speak about the teaching and learning of grammar. In previous years, we've had a number of other great plenary presentations on a variety of themes such as professional development, um, curriculum, uh, vocabulary acquisition, and I do wish to point out that the videos of those plenary presentations are available to watch online if you are interested in checking them out. Um, this year's theme, of course, is assessment for learning. And my colleague Maria McCormick will deliver the plenary presentation. Um, I do wish to thank Maria for sharing her expertise on assessment in her plenary talk this morning. I also wish to thank all of the other presenters who are contributing uh, to this event through their presentations and professional knowledge. The School of uh, Professional Studies events management team has meticulously uh, arranged and prepared this event. Um, so I want to thank them in advance for what will be uh, what we hope will be a great event. Um, and finally, I wish to thank those who have offered to volunteer and help today. Um, and now, without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Mary Pickett, the director of the American Language Program, who will introduce our plenary speaker. Thanks. OK. Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Christopher. And again, as he said, welcome to our uh, ninth annual American Language Program Winter Conference. Um, uh, we are thrilled to uh, be back in person for the first time since February 2020, uh, when looking back on that occasion, we were probably spreading more than just knowledge. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that we, <laughs> that we can convene in much better circumstances now. Um, I am going to keep this brief. Um, as Christopher said, my job is to uh, introduce uh, today's plenary speaker, Maria McCormack. Uh, Maria has been a faculty member at the American Language Program since 1996 uh, and full-time since 1999. Uh, she teaches a wide range of classes um, and has specialized over the years, particularly in teaching pronunciation, um, uh, especially to international teaching assistants. Um, here at Columbia. Uh, and in recent years, she's uh, also focused more on advanced level writing courses for undergraduate students. Um, her research interests include pragmatics uh, and language proficiency scaling. And she's currently exploring uh, the specific speech features of international TAs, which lead to lower levels of comprehensibility by students. Uh, in addition to teaching, Maria also serves as the ALP's Associate Director for Curriculum and assessment. Um, in this role, she has been instrumental uh, in helping us clarify student learning outcomes for all our courses and ensuring that there is alignment between our curriculum and our assessment. Uh, she also performs regular analysis of our high stakes advanced level writing exams um, and uh, the uh, consistency and reliability of our faculty raters. Um, she played a, a, a huge role in helping us switch to a project-based curriculum for our summer courses, uh, including the adoption of the Common European Framework of Reference Mediation Scales. Uh, she truly is a thought leader in the area of assessment for our program, and thus the perfect person to be speaking about just that subject today. So please join me in welcoming to the podium, Maria McCormack. Check, check. Can you hear me? Yeah? OK, good. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So several years ago, I attended a TESOL presentation. I think it was in Chicago, uh, where the presenters were talking about how they changed their assessment procedures in their intensive English program. And during the Q&A, one of the presenters said that assessment more than any other aspects of their program tended to bring out the faculty's critical and even passionately argumentative sides. I think he was being really tactful. Um, he, but I think what he meant was it was fractious. It was fraught. It was contentious. I thought, I can relate. 
Uh, fast forward to 2022, and when sitting down to plan this plenary talk, um, I had a lot of trouble. I was blocked. And after several weeks of this, I decided to put it aside for an afternoon and knit. And while sitting there knitting, I was thinking, why is this so hard? Why is this so hard? And then the dam broke, and I realized that this is hard because assessment is hard. It is hard in so many ways. I started thinking about why it is hard and all the ways it is hard, and I filled up several notebook pages, and that is the basis for what I'll be sharing with you today. But don't worry, it won't all be so grim. I'll mostly be talking about language assessment, but there are times when this overlaps or trends spring from general education, even early childhood education that has influenced our field. I've cast a broad net, hoping to provide a historical and theoretical context in which to situate many of the excellent presentations we'll be seeing today. So let's get started. Why is assessment so hard? It's hard because we have to decide what we are assessing. This is no easy task. Language ability is a complex psychological construct. Let's look at an example. I attended a webinar in August where I heard Mario Lopez Gopar speak. Uh, he's a professor um, at a Mexican university in Oaxaca. Yes. And they train English teachers. TOEFL is required at the end of Wakaka's teacher training programs. In other words, Wakaka's local tests are not enough. Now, do you see any problems with using TOEFL to certify English teachers of young learners? Do you see any problems with that? What problems do you see? Go ahead, Chris. It's a mismatch. Yeah, it's a mismatch, right? We're, we're not testing what we want them to actually do. TOEFL is designed for students going off to college to sort of predict how they'll do in college. Whereas teachers of young learners probably need a very different skill set and very different language abilities. So how do we decide what language ability is for the context we're testing in and which aspects are, uh, excuse me, are necessary? Let's take a little historical tour. Back in the 1950s, educational psychologists started thinking about what language ability is for the first time. And our attempts to define constructs of language ability have evolved significantly since then. What I'm showing you now is Robert Lado's 1960 um, uh, construct of language ability, specifically for testing. He was at Georgetown University. Um, he was a psychometrician and a linguist. And he posited that language consists of speaking, listening, reading, and writing, down the left. And then across the top, pronunciation, grammatical structure, the lexicon, and cultural meanings. And that's it. And in order to test language, you needed to design test items that hit those boxes. And when you do that, you're testing language. And actually, that was a pretty dramatic step forward because before that, testing in language probably meant, here, take this text and translate it, right? Okay. So this was, this was pretty much of a breakthrough. As some of you might know, in the 1980s, Canali and Swain contributed to the idea of what language is by asking, well, wait a minute, in all these skills and elements, where's communication? We use language to communicate. So that should be a part of our language construct. So they also said that communicative competence is something that we should try to define 
and measure in language tests. Because if we don't, then we're not capturing what language ability really is. So in their model, you can see that communicative competence consists of grammatical competence, sociolinguistic competence, and strategic competence. For them, strategic competence consisted, uh, or sorry, served a mainly compensatory function. In other words, it was there for when breakdown occurred in communication, uh, and it was the individual's ability to repair that situation. So compensatory role. But even so, how do we measure that in a test if that's a main part of language ability? Bachman and Palmer, starting in the 1990s, started to use <laughs> started to use empirical studies to try to get at the heart of what language act ability actually is. As you can see, it became rather complex in the 1990s. Um, I think I'm going to use my little laser beam. Yeah, that little piece over there, that little piece right there, that's language knowledge. That's language. All the rest of this stuff is other stuff besides language knowledge. Yeah. So, and, and then what is language knowledge? All this. Oh my God. You might be thinking, this is getting a little abstract. How am I supposed to use this to design a test? And to be fair, Bachman and Palmer did um, uh, include a lot of uh, instructions for how to construct a test from this. But it's getting pretty complicated. A different approach was taken by McNamara in 1996. And McNamara, Tim McNamara, is Australian. And he was interested in performance assessment, specifically in the context of an English test that certified healthcare workers from overseas to work in that field in Australia. Important, right? You want your doctor to be able to understand you, and you want to be able to understand them. So it's language within a particular context. He said that teasing apart the different dimensions of performance from language ability is like opening a Pandora's box. It's so complicated. Because there's that certain je ne sais quoi <laughs> about people who are good communicators. He quoted in his book, um, uh, his book, Language, Measuring Second Language Performance, he quoted on page 78 one of the developers of our Foreign Service Institute oral proficiency interview. That's the interview that um, the government gives to potential diplomats who are going overseas to make sure that they're able to communicate well in the language in which they'll be serving. And one of the developers of this test uh, said, quote, on the other hand, I know people who butcher the language, whose accents are atrocious, and whose vocabularies are limited. For those reasons, we give them a low proficiency rating. Yet, for some reason, some of them are effective communicators. OK, that probably wouldn't fly in an academic journal today. Um, but uh, I think you get the point. So this is hard. What is that some reason why some people are effective communicators? McNamara, in 1996, called for more research in talk in interaction because he thought abilities for use should focus more on the candidate in interaction. Uh, his work raises, sorry, let me go back there. So what I mean when I say talk and interaction, I mean some of the fields that many of you, or some of you at least, in this audience study. Discourse analysis, conversation analysis. These are the ways that we can understand talk and interaction. So his work raises interesting questions about how other attributes of a situation or an individual interact with language ability in a performance assessment.
Like McNamara's approach, the action-oriented approach of the CEFR, that's Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, uh, focuses on what a learner can do in a language, similar to McNamara in that way. This, however, the CEFR, is a huge project. I wish I brought the book with me. It's huge. Okay? Uh, it's extremely comprehensive. It utilized backward design from real life tasks back to assessment tasks. And it, not necessarily assessment, assessment tasks, but scales of language ability, descriptors of, of language ability. It uses can-do statements. In other words, it doesn't focus on what the learner cannot do yet, but focuses on what they can do. And the, I think the emphasis is really on do. It's action-oriented. The framework aims to align teaching curriculum and assessment, and it's meant to be adapted to local contexts. And as Mary pointed out, I've used um, several of the scales in um, rubrics that we use at the ALP. Most, late, most recently, the mediation scales, which were added in 2018. So this framework emphasizes the learner as a social agent who collaborates with others towards meaningful goals. Language is about doing meaningful things. They have to do something is what one teacher says on the website. So assessment is hard because as we have developed our concept of what language ability means, it's become more and more complex. So once we know what we are assessing, then we have to make sure that our test is consistent. In other words, we have to make sure that the test is producing scores that we can trust. In testing lingo, we call this reliability. We write reliable tests. What does that mean? It means that according to classical test theory, a person's test score equals their performance on the test plus error. Let me say that again. A person's score on a test consists of their true ability plus error. So what's error? Error seems like something that we want to minimize because we want the test score to reflect as, actual, as accurately as possible their true ability, right? So we want to minimize error. What are some things that might cause error on a test? That's a real question. Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge about the topic, yes. Not understanding the instructions, unclear instructions, yes? Also, what about falsely responsive instructions? Right, the, there might be um, uh, instructions or items on the test that are culturally unfamiliar for the student. All of these things contribute to measurement error. <laughs> Bachman put it this way, how much of an individual's test performance is due to measurement error or to factors other than the language ability we want to measure? And here I want to point out that error can take different forms. On the right side, we see random error. That could be things like how a person's feeling that day, they're sleepy, they didn't have breakfast, the air conditioning was too strong, random error. On the left, though, we see something that's mm, maybe a bit more concerning for language testers is when the error is systematic. When the error is systematic, that means we're not controlling for something. To get rid of this kind of random error, 
we need to use um, systematic procedures. For example, in test administration, in our rubrics, in our norming, in the environment in which the test is given, all of those things have to be as similar, systematic as possible, so that we're reducing the error in the test. Um, here's an example. Back in the 90s, my Russian friend Andre was coming to study in the US and went to Moscow to take the TOEFL. The testing site was a huge gymnasium filled with little school desks, little school children desks. So here's my friend Andre kind of crumpled into his little school children desk in this huge gymnasium and taking the TOEFL. And it was time for the listening section of the test. The proctor pulled out a little tape recorder like this one and popped in a cassette. <laughs> So, do you think this may have produced some systematic error? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so these are the kind of things that we want to control for. So assessment is hard because we have to control for all these factors that may introduce error that may make our test inconsistent. Furthermore, a test can be internally consistent, that is, reliable, and still be unfair for some test takers. What do I mean by that? Uh, for example, I was once writing test items for Pearson, which produces English tests that are used globally. And one day we all got a memo about certain topics we should avoid in item writing. Um, and that included lobsters. And, you know, for example, is it fair to ask a, a student from Chad or Nepal a question that involves lobsters? I ask you. I think no, right? Okay, so no more lobsters. <laughs> so there are certain topics um, that have to be, you know, removed because they could be introducing bias in a test. They could be unfair for certain test takers. So for that lobster item, what we might see is students from different countries performing differently. That's not fair. This could apply to any groups, males and females, for example. If they're performing differently on the test because of their group affiliation, um, that's not fair. In the US, we see this with racial backgrounds. It's called differential item functioning, DIF, and we try to minimize it. But think about this. When we get rid of all the lobster questions, we strip tests down to make them very decontextualized, very bland. Some say that this is also not okay because it's not authentic. We don't talk that way. We don't talk in bland terms. We talk about meaningful things. We don't use language in a decontextualized way. It's always situated. Or other people say that test items are actually never decontextualized. It's just that the context is that of the dominant group. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. I hear, I hear some of my ALP, ALP colleagues kind of like, oh no, here comes that chart. Okay, I promise it won't be hard. That last example was about fairness in individual test items, like for a listening or a reading test. But what about fairness in a performance assessment, like speaking or writing, that involves raters and different prompts? So in this table, can you see different colors? Okay. So in this table, the raters are red, the examinees are green, and the prompts are blue. And toward the top is more ability, more severity, more difficulty. And toward the bottom is less severity, less ability, easier. Tell your neighbor, if you were taking this test, I don't know, can you see the numbers? Can you see these numbers here? Barely? Okay, if you were taking this test, who would you want rating your exam? 
Tell your neighbor. <laughs> you want Bobby rating your exam? Oh, <laughs> actually, I made that up. I just totally made this up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So which reader do you want? None of them? <laughs> okay. Oh, these are the te these are the examinees. So the examinees don't read each other's papers. Would you want 14 or would you rather have zero? 14, 14 because they're the dove. Right? They're the dove, they're the easy raider. Okay? Zero's zero's tough. You know? If you get zero, mm. And if, if there are two raiders involved, if you get zero and one or two, that's going to produce a very different result. Probably, as we can see in this column, these are different score levels, score bands. You might get a completely different score band than someone who was read by 14, right? Actually, two score bands. Is that fair? Is that fair that it depends on who reads your essay, what score you get? No, it's not. That's why we have statistical methods like this to control for that. But it's a problem. And that's not all. Fairness just refers to the internal characteristics of a test. Justice refers to the external uses of a test. Assessments have to be not only fair, but also just. Let me give you some examples. This is from McNamara et al, uh, 19, 2019. They really explain in detail what fair and just test use means. And they say, even a test that was as fair as it could be could be made to be carefully designed, validated, its areas of weakness identified and remedied as far as was humanly possible, might still involve issues of justice in the very fact that it's used at all. Here's an example. Uh, a branch of the UN called the International Civil Aviation Organization runs English proficiency tests for pilots and air traffic controllers worldwide. Did you know that English is the language of pilots and air traffic controllers worldwide? It is. Okay, so these tests, um, pilots and air traffic controllers generally have to pass these tests. Now, um, does that sound like a good idea to you? But they should be able to talk, right? They should be able to communicate. I want my pilot to be able to talk to the air traffic controller, right? Seems, seems reasonable. So then let me tell you this. Korea and Japan published the test content online and allowed pilots and air traffic controllers from their country to repeat the test as often as necessary until they pass. How do you feel about that? It's the culture cram, baby, cram. Okay. So Kim and Elder in 2015 investigated so-called near misses. So here's a picture of a near miss. A near miss is when two planes almost collide or when uh, a crash almost occurs. And what Kim and Elder found was that they were rarely caused by language proficiency issues, but by failure on the part of the air traffic controllers and the pilots to follow certain protocols. Furthermore, those responsible for near misses were more often native English speakers or those with highest proficiency, not low proficiency. On the other hand, experienced pilots, air traffic controllers, who might be a little older, were at most risk of losing their jobs from not passing the English test. 
So that explains why Japan and Korea just published, published the test online, made sure that those experienced air traffic controllers and pilots passed the test. So here we have an English test being used in an unjust way. It doesn't have anything to do with the internal characteristics of the test, although those are problematic as well. But it has to do with the fact that this test is used at all. It's unjust. So as I mentioned, those pilots and air traffic controllers could lose their jobs for not passing an English test. That's an important thing. That's an important decision. So language testing is hard because important decisions might rely on it. Do any of you know of a test that serves a gatekeeper function? I think everybody in this room does, right? OK, that's important. Because tests often serve as gatekeepers, ethical uses of tests call for rigorous arguments. And this is reflected in evolving notions of test validity. It's a little bit abstract. Bear with me. So Messick, in 1989, introduced a construct-based model of validity. Why his model was groundbreaking is that he said that validity includes the social consequences of the score interpretation and use. So it's not just that the items all have to be functioning well and be consistent. Test developers are responsible for the social consequences of the test use, the impact. He called this consequential validity. Michael Caine, in 2004, took this a step further. He used a different approach. He used an argument-based model of validity. And he said that an interpretive argument must be made and defended for decisions and claims made on the basis of test scores. So whereas Messick was saying, it's the test scores that we have to be concerned about. Kane went a step further and said, it's actually the decisions made on the basis of those test scores that have to be justified and defended in an ass assessment use argument, an AUA. For example, a test developer can't just design a test, sell it to the New York Board of Ed, and say, OK, all done, leaving the Board of Ed to use it in whatever fashion they wish. Okay, so that wouldn't be a valid or ethical use of a test. Because the test givers are making decisions about the test takers, assessment is a form of power over one, of one group of people over another. Tests are power. Scholars from many fields have begun to call out what they see as unjust uses of tests. Uh, the best example is Alana Shahemi. She's an Israeli testing researcher. She's known in the field of language assessment for being one of the first in the subfield of critical language testing. She says, critical language testing refers to the need to question the uses of tests as tools of power and to examine their uses in education and society. She's looked at things like uh, Israeli language testing of new immigrants used to determine who is a real Israeli, English language proficiency tests operating to perpetuate global power relations, like that aviation test I told you about. French language tests in Northern Africa used to reinforce colonizer dominance over colonized populations, and so forth and so on. An issue that hits closer to home is ITA oral testing at universities. Some of you may know that many states have laws for public universities about the English proficiency of international teaching assistants. Kim, in a study in 2019, cites the text of one such law. This is the text of the law from their state uh, in her highly critical take on ITA testing at universities. From Kim's perspective, this testing is an expression of oppressive power that serves to otherize international students. 
So assessment is hard because it embodies power relationships that may be unjust or have really harsh consequences in people's lives, which is one reason why emotions run high where assessment is concerned in the larger culture as well as in our classrooms. This is one of my favorite books. It's called Thanks for the Feedback, The Science and Art of Receiving Feedback Well, Even When It Is Off Base, Unfair, Poorly Delivered, and Frankly, You're Not in the Mood. <laughs> I like this book because it talks about different types of feedback. And they say, the authors, Douglas Stone and Sheila Heen, say, broadly, feedback comes in three forms, appreciation, which means thanks. Coaching, here's a better way to do it. Or evaluation, here's where you stand. In our classrooms, we teachers, I think, we see ourselves often as coaches, right? Switching to that evaluation mode can be a difficult change of mindset. So emotions run high. Numbers in tech are often involved with testing. That's another reason that makes it hard. Most language teacher education programs don't have a strong quantitative component. So scores and research on scores can be inaccessible or off-pitting. We're language teachers. We went into this field because we don't like math, right? In many cases. I do question that to a certain extent, though. I attended several classes at TC in communication disorders. That's uh, classes for speech pathologists. And our instructor, Catherine Crowley, had us trained to be able to interpret the technical manual and the scores of any test that could get a child placed in special education. We had to have it down. She would not tolerate anybody saying, oh, no, I don't get it. I'm not a math person. Okay? Because really important decisions were based on that. You had to be able to interpret those numbers. The increasing use of tech poses a similar problem, especially with regard to automated scoring. I saw a webinar in August. It wasn't a webinar. It was an interview on a YouTube channel. I don't know how to classify this. Um, it was called The Validity of Automated Scoring in the Era of Machine Learning and Big Data by Xiaoming Shi. And it was on the Statistics and Theory YouTube channel. Check it out. <laughs> All right, so she asked, what has changed in recent years? First, automated scoring. You guys know what I mean when I say automated scoring of essays and speaking? Okay. All right, so automated scoring is increasingly used for high stakes purposes. She says it doesn't make headlines anymore. Also, there are variations in applications and purposes such as feedback. I think that's actually kind of exciting that an automated essay scorer can give the student feedback that will help them as diagnostic purposes. Users, that means both test takers and people who are giving the test, institutions, are becoming less selective due to the pandemic. We were really scrambling for a while there, right? So we needed to use tests that could be easily delivered online and perhaps scored in an automate, with an automated engine. And she also says that deep learning methods are becoming popular, so-called black boxes. I know that sounds automated. I'm going to talk about that um, in a little bit. So an automated scoring engine, such as the one TOEFL uses, along with one human rater, so TOEFL uses one e-rater e score and one human score, um, until recently has been based on algorithms created by humans with, inputs, with input from applied linguists. So um, the scoring engine, the algorithm is based on what humans consider to be good language. And on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about black boxes. So the takeaway here is that the meaning of the scores, especially from automated scoring engines, becomes inaccessible to those without statistical or machine learning backgrounds. We feel removed from the scores. That makes it hard. 
Here's a little bit about black boxes and white boxes. So in a so-called white box, like I said, the one that TOEFL uses, um, the features on which the scores are based are determined by applied linguists. So the, the algorithm looks for things like markers of cohesion, semantic, um, semantic variables. Um, in a black box, which is becoming more and more common, and we see this in other aspects of life, like chatbots, et cetera, um, they use deep neural networks. The connections in which the connections between layers or nodes is impossible to decipher. So we put the essay in, we get a score. We don't know how the network determined that score. It's just based on lots and lots of training data. So it's not transparent. So far in this plenary, I've been talking about all the reasons that assessment is hard, because it has to be valid, consistent, fair, and just. It has to produce scores that we can confidently use to make decisions about people's lives, yet with limited resources, real world constraints. And you might be thinking, OK, OK, we get it. Assessment is hard. This plenary is such a downer. <laughs> but now I'd like to posit one final reason why assessment is hard. Assessment is so hard because it matters. Working hard at assessment leads to better curriculum. Assessment when you have no role in creating it can seem like the boogeyman, as in, oh my god, this class is just test prep. And there are plenty of studies that show that poorly conceived assessment can have negative washback on curriculum. Absolutely. But it works both ways. Bad assessment drives bad curriculum. Good assessment drives good curriculum. It forces you to specifically identify what you want the students to know and be able to do. When you do this, you will then build it into your curriculum, build in your, into your curriculum the steps that the students need to take to get there. Oh, my tea is out of whack. Aw. <laughs> Nevertheless, we work hard on assessment because it's an integral part of what we do. You're going to see this triangle a lot. I have it hanging over my desk at work. If the assessment part is done poorly, it wrecks the other two. If it's done well, it enhances the other two. Rubrics are considered assessment, but they're actually curriculum. Rubrics force teachers to identify clearly what they are trying to teach students. That's why people work so hard to create good rubrics. So for example, consider voice in student writing. Hard to teach, right? Putting voice into a rubric category leads or encourages or forces you to think about what it is. What is voice? How do I design materials for it? How do I situate it among other goals in my curriculum? Here's another example. In the last several years, there's been a move away from trying to assess writing in an isolated construct, as an isolated construct, removing all traces of so-called irrelevant variants, like reading the prompt. Instead, people are trying to think about what writers actually do in the world, especially in academic writing se settings. And that usually involves reading into writing. Again, a hard thing to teach reading into writing. Developing a rubric for it can help clarify the course design, as Chan et al. showed in their 2015 study. In other words, working hard on rubrics can improve curriculum. We could argue that they are curriculum. When done well, assessment can improve curriculum in an ongoing iterative process, not just one and done. Here's an example. One writing program I'm familiar with was using portfolio assessment across their sequence of first year writing courses. Each semester, the faculty got together 
and read a sample of the student portfolios from across the many sections of the course, affectionately known as the tattered folders, which I've tried to uh, represent for you on the left. In order to make, and the reason they were reading these tattered folders is to make sure that there is evidence of students having met the curricular learning objectives. So they just took a sample. They didn't read all of them. They got together in focus groups and they read a sample of the tattered folders. And in one such session, faculty were noticing and discussing the lack of evidence in the portfolios of two of the curricular learning objectives, awareness and reflection and the writing process. They couldn't see it. One faculty member remarked, you know, the way we can improve this is by going with digital portfolios. And so they did. They implemented digital portfolios in this writing program and it drove curricular change in reflective writing and process writing because the students then had to include everything, their brainstorming, their exercises, etc., and then in their digital portfolio also reflect uh, on how that changed the way they completed a project. Students became really involved in this kind of multimodal way of assessment and it helped learning. My final example of how working hard on assessment leads to improved curriculum is a little trickier so bear with me. This is a scholarly assessment project. De Janeiro in 2009 examined differences in writing performance of international versus generation, point one point, generation 1.5 students. When I say generation 1.5 students, I'm referring to students who weren't born in the United States but came here at a young age. So they attended at least high school here, right? The study challenged the assumption that grammar would be the main difference between the international students and the Gen 1.5 students. And De Janeiro found that content was most difficult for Gen 1.5 students, whereas rhetorical control was most difficult for international students. So this is kind of something new, kind of counterintuitive. She explained very well in her study why that could be the case. But the takeaway here is that she suggested that differentiated instruction may be warranted for these groups, as well as more precise rating scales to capture the differences between these two groups. It wasn't what we thought it was anecdotally. It was something different that was captured in the assessment and it might have led to curricular uh, change. So here we see how scholarly examination of the products of our assessments can help us redesign the curriculum to meet the identified needs of the students. All right, so far we've been seeing how working hard at assessment can approve curriculum. Now I'm going to take a step further. I'm going to posit that assessment improves teaching. Again, these are all part of what we do even with my misplaced T. If the assessment part is done poorly, it wrecks the other two. If it is done well, it enhances the other two. Assessment and teaching are related to each other intimately. Here I'm going to broaden what I mean by assessment to include formative assessment or assessment for learning. Uh, Black et al this book here, um, produced this seminal work in assessment for learning in 1998. And according to Black et al, an assessment activity can help learning if it provides information to be used as feedback by teachers and by their students in assessing themselves and each other to modify the teaching and learning activities in which they are engaged. Such assessment becomes formative assessment when the evidence is used to adapt the teacher work to meeting student needs. 
They go on to say that, quote, formative assessment can occur many times in every lesson. It can involve several different methods for encouraging students to express that what they are thinking and several different ways of acting on such evidence. It has to be within the control of the individual teacher. And for this reason, change in formative assessment practice is an integral and intimate part of a teacher's daily work. So Black et al. Uh, conducted an extensive review of the literature on formative assessment. They found a mean effect size for most studies in their meta-analysis. They found that a mean effect size for most studies was between 0.4 and 0.7. So an effect size can range from negative 1 to 1. And a positive effect size means learning gains, right? Effect size of 0.3 or greater means significant, a large, a large effect. So they found in the research large effect sizes in terms of learning gains as a result of formative assessment practices. So then they wanted to put it into practice, as the title suggests. So they worked with middle school science, math, and English teachers in six schools to develop practices that would close the gap between research and real life teaching. And they focused on collaboration with teachers to take forward formative practice in these four areas, questioning, feedback through marking, peer and self-assessment by students, and the formative use of summative tests. So we are assessing students informally all the time as teachers. Work in discourse and conversation analysis such as Carol Lowe's dissertation, eliminates how understanding develops in classroom interaction. Small changes in a student's formative assessment practice can have big effects on learning. So let's see what this might look like in a classroom. I have some volunteers to help in this situation, yeah. Come on forward, all of you people I've recruited. Okay. This is an example from Black et al. Um, these two extracts are from a science class. It's the same teacher and the same students on the right and on the left. The one on the right was recorded, so the one on the right was recorded about six months after the one on the left. So this is a transcript of the classroom interaction. The one on, sorry, during, as I said, this one was recorded about six months after that one, and during that time, the teacher in question um, was working really hard on the formative assessment technique of questioning. All right, so the last thing I'll say, I'll just set this up for you a little bit. This is a science class, and in the transcript on the left, the teacher is talking about electricity. Okay, and then I'll tell you, I'll set this one up when we get to it. All right, so teacher, off you go. All right, okay, right. I want everyone to concentrate now uh, because uh, you need some information before you start today's experiment. Okay, we're gonna, today we're going to find out about these. Uh, anyone know what we call these and where you might find one? Look carefully, where have you seen something like this? You, you might have seen something like it before. What is it involved with? It's got a, a special name. Uh, yes, Jay? Electricity, sir. That, that's right. You, you can use these in electric circuits. Anyone know what it's called? Uh, this word here helps. Can you, can you read what it says, Carolyn? Amps. <clears throat> and, and what is this instrument called that measures in amps? No one? No? Well, well it's an amateur because it measures in amps. Uh, what's it called, Jamie? clock, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't listening, Jamie. It might look like a clock, but it's called an... Um, Richard? An amp meter, sir. Uh, nearly. Carolyn? An amateur. Uh, thank you. Uh, what's it called, Jamie? An amateur. 
<laughs> That's right, an amateur. And where do we find these amateurs, uh, Monica? Monica? Uh, no idea. Tell her, Rebecca. In electric circuits. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's the before. Okay. Now we're going to fast forward six months later. This teacher has been working very hard on their questioning techniques for formative assessment. And here we have a lesson on photosynthesis. And the teacher starts the class by bringing out two geranium plants. And one is green and pink and vital and healthy and blooming. And the other one is all desiccated and dry and, and dead. Okay. Puts them on the desk. And then asks the question, why do you think these two plants look so different? Have a think, then talk to your partner. Go ahead. <clears throat> why do you think uh, these plants have grown differently? Okay. Oh, I, I'm, the, I'm the narrator. The class erupts into discussion in pairs, loud discussion in pairs. The teacher goes over to the side bench and checks the apparatus. After four minutes, the teacher returns to the front and stops the class discussion. OK, ideas? About half the class put up their hands. Teacher waits for three seconds. A few more hands go up. Uh, Monica, uh, your group first. Uh, that one's bigger because it was on the window. Uh, on the window, hmm. What, what do you think, Jamie? Uh, we thought that... Uh, you thought? That the big end had eaten up more light. <laughs> I, I think I know what Monica and Jamie are getting at, but uh, can, uh, can anyone put the ideas together? Window, light, plants? Again, about half the class put up their hands. The teacher chooses a child who has not put up his hand. Richard? Uh, yes, we thought, me and Dean, that it had grown bigger because it was getting more food. Some students stretch their hand up higher. The teacher points to Susan and nods. No, it grows where there is a lot of light, and that's near the window. Hmm. Richard and Dean think the plant's getting more food. Uh, Susan and Stacy as well? Yes, Susan thinks it's because this plant is getting more light. What do others think? T Tariq? It's the light because it's photosynthesis. Plants feed by photosynthesis. The teacher writes photosynthesis on the board. Who else has heard this word before? The teacher points to the board. Almost all hands go up. OK. Well, can anyone put plant, light, window, and photosynthesis together and tell me why these two plants have grown differently? The teacher waits 12 seconds. Ten hands went up immediately after he stopped speaking. Five more go up in the pause. Okay. Carolyn? And the plant, the big plant has been getting more light by the window, and because plants make their own food by photosynthesis, it's... Bigger! <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, it goes on a little bit more on the next page. All right. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So my question for you, and I know that I know that these numbers don't line up, and that you probably can't see this very well. Um, but where was the teacher assessing? Do you have any idea where the teacher was assessing? Yes. Uh, waiting for the hands to go up. Hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So waiting for the so offering wait time so that more students could ask a question and then using wait time. Yes. How about using culturally responsive teaching methods? Could be. From build and bridge, tapping into the funds of knowledge, and also using question sets to assess and have students work in groups, use graphic organizing, yep. and also we have to use equitable equitable instruction. Not equitable okay. for individual education. Great. Science. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want to let a couple Bye. other people speak. Yes, Bobby? By, um, the teacher was also assessing by listening to what the students were saying and giving feedback. Yeah. Yes. And so you can see here that in, in the first example, the teacher was using questions so more for like classroom management. Like, oh, I see you are sleeping. OK, fine. No idea. Fine. On to the next. Whereas here, the, the teacher is really pausing, allowing time, 
allowing students to think, answer questions, calling on students who maybe were a little bit later and holding up their hands. But he is getting the information that he is after, right? He's finding out how much the students really understand this process of photosynthesis. Whereas here, it's just like, what's this called? Do you remember what this is called? It's just kind of like memorizing facts. OK, yes? Could be in general knowledge of the students. Maybe the students know the general knowledge, but they just mm -hmm. don't know the vocabulary. True, yes, yes. They, the teacher might, actually, this is not an ESL class, but it's, it's true. The students might just not remember that photosynthesis word. So once someone mentioned the word photosynthesis, he wrote it on the board. And then that sparked a whole new round of discussion among the students. Excellent. So here we can see that people who are working hard at formative assessment are working hard at teaching. This is what teaching is, right? Say yes. <laughs> All right. So the work of Black et al. really showed the benefits of formative assessment in a comprehensive way and large scale setting. A big part of how the teachers in the project changed their teaching practice was by repeatedly getting together and discussing their integration of formative assessment practices. So that teacher was going regularly, meeting with other teachers, talking about how to integrate this into their practice. And so here's an additional example of that. As I mentioned before, um, a writing program that I know of, um, which is John Jay uh, College of Criminal Justice first year writing program. And at John Jay, they practice um, a cycle of portfolio reading and faculty focus groups every semester. So the faculty read a random sample of student portfolios, no, no longer the tattered folders, but the digital portfolios, uh, and participate in fo focus groups. And you could say this is faculty development in itself. Oh, look at how they did, look at how this, the class did it. Oh, these students do it differently from mine. And did the next. Aha. OK. So um, yes, the faculty, um, before reading, identify weaknesses in the portfolios relative to a selection of the curriculum's learning objectives. So they might say, I, really, I think we really should read for this learning objective when we read the portfolio. So they choose these in advance, uh, which of the objectives they will focus on. These areas that they focus on or that they identify through their reading of the portfolios together then become topics for faculty development prior to the following semester. And this happens every semester on a cyclical basis. So obviously the faculty development ends up leading to better teaching. So this is an example of a very systematic way of including formative assessment in, in a program-wide sense. Um, and although the two examples I just described are from outside the domain of language assessment per se, I think it's easy to see how these practices can carry over into our field. All right. Up to now, we've seen how working hard on assessment can improve curriculum, and that working hard on formative assessment practices can improve teaching. And of course, the desired result of all this is improved student, student learning. So finally, coming to the theme of today's conference, I'm going to posit that assessment can indeed enhance learning. As with the work of Black and William, the work in examining student language learning resulting from assessment has its roots in general education. A lot of the work um, in this field comes from Poner and Lantolf in their work in dynamic assessment. Dynamic assessment is based on Zygotsky's uh, zone, uh, theory of the zone of proximal development. Everybody remember that from grad school? Okay. So the idea is that um, the innermost part, A, is what a learner can do independently. The middle ring, ZPD, is the zone of proximal development, what learners can do with support from their peers or from the teacher. And the B on the outside is what learners can't do even, even with support. 
So the idea of dynamic assessment is that we really try to get farther into that zone of proximal development within the language assessment process. That's because um, those who subscribe to Vygotsky's sociocultural theory believe that learning unfolds in social contexts through mediation. I believe that too. That's how language happens in social contexts. Learning can take place even within a single session, a single class, a single language assessment. Um, Wirt calls this microgenesis, and I love that word. I'm going to use it many times, <laughs> microgenesis. Um, their work, so Pantoff and Lerner, Lanto, Pen, puh, puh, Poner and Lantoff's work um, involves designing language tests that can measure the learner's actual score, that would be the A, their mediated score, that's with help or support from the teacher, and then from that they calculate a learning potential score. They're doing this in a second language context, but a lot of the work in dynamic assessment comes from early childhood education, especially in Israel. Researchers working with children who had been, been diagnosed with learning disabilities attempted to find out what these children could achieve when their assessment was mediated with interaction from the teacher, what we might refer to as hints or scaffolding. Some children were easily able to enter or stay in mainstream classes with support. And I know that this has become standard practice in, in some school districts, including the one my kids went to. It's called RTI, Response to Intervention. So before um, classifying a child, before giving a child an IEP, they test out, they use something called Response to Intervention, which involves this type of dynamic assessment to see what the student's potential is, whether they can respond with a little bit of support and therefore stay in the mainstream classes. So dynamic assessment in language uh, assessment is a pretty hot topic right now. Um, there's a special issue of language assessment quarterly in dynamic assessment in Chinese context from January 2023. See the bibliography if you're interested. So when done right, dynamic assessment can enhance learning by helping both the learners and the teachers know where they are at and how much more they need to learn. That's a big slide. I'm going to explain it. So the learning gauge from formative assessment practices seen in the general education literature, primarily Black and William, led to or coincided with exploration of what learning-oriented assessment looks like in language assessment. And because this field was growing and there wasn't a lot of research in the area, Turner and Papura's 2016 working framework of learning-oriented assessment suggested a way forward for test developers and researchers. Turner and Papura proposed seven interrelated yet independent dimensions of teaching, learning, and assessment in classrooms. For example, starting at the top, the contextual dimension concerns the real-life language use domains in which learners would realistically demonstrate their L2 knowledge. Then counterclockwise, the elicitation dimension uh, would be concerned with how evidence of learners' second language knowledge, skills, and abilities can be elicited to reflect their expected proficiency. And then going one step further, um, the proficiency dimension, which uh, relates to the targeted L2 knowledge, skills, and abilities learners are expected to demonstrate based on the curriculum, instruction, or standards. So I won't go through all of these, but I do want to point out that this has been mm, very helpful in sort of determining a path forward in the kinds of information we want to gather about how learning-oriented assessment works in second language classrooms. One concrete way that language testers are exploring the relationship between assessment and learning is through scenario-based assessment. What is scenario-based assessment? Anthony Kunin, uh, who designed a um, one scenario-based assessment for an Asian university, says, describes it this way. 
Tasks developed for the test are housed within scenarios or hypothetical situations, which can be described as a story of characters and a series of events that follow logically. In a test situation, the test taker is placed as a key character within the scenario. So there's a, there's a whole scenario with a series of tasks. It's on a computer, and the learner is one of the, play, the players, not like a video game, but one of the characters in, in this situation. So let's look at Kunin's uh, scenario-based assessment. Um, it was an English language test uh, for placement and diagnostic purposes at an Asian university. It was designed collaboratively with local teachers and students. And in it, a series of test tasks are embedded within scenarios that include a cast of characters and a goal-oriented storyline, such as applying for a visa. In the test, the students read a notice. Here's the notice, last reminder for visa application. They watch a video. They fill in an application form, and they write a short paragraph to state their reasons for applying for the application. So you can see that this is meaningful, it's goal-driven, it's purposeful, and it's appropriate for the local context. Kunin et al. developed this test drawing upon Purpura and Turner's working framework of LOA that I showed on the previous slide. The he said, the test development process placed the elicitation dimension at the center of the scenarios and the contextual and proficiency dimensions as additional dimensions of interest. So what we can see here is that when testing is done as an authentic language experience, it produces a learning encounter that is worthwhile for students because it makes sense. A second example of scenario-based assessment can be found in Heidi Lubanerjee's work. The theme of the test she studied was nutrition ambassadors. And in this test, students proceed through a task flow that includes listening, reading, pre-writing, and writing. So I know that you can't read all the text here, but this just gives you a feeling for what the test would look like for the test taker. You have characters that are re recurring through the whole thing. They might be teachers, they might be other students. And here, Paul is saying, Great, now we need a paragraph to introduce the commonly seen unsafe food additives. So this is all about food additives. Um, so Jane says, yes, why don't you try and write a one paragraph summary to teach people about the unsafe food additives? So the students have already read an article about food additives. And she sort of gives a little scaffolding. I think the summary should include what are the unsafe food additives? Where can we find these unsafe food additives? What can these unsafe food additives do to our health? So giving a little prompting, a little, a little scaffolding. And then Mrs. Norman says, sounds like a plan. Again, in your paragraph, please make sure all the information is correct and only the important and necessary information is included. So then up here, the students will write their summary. So Banerjee's study examined the role of topical knowledge as a part of communicative language ability. And what's special here is that like Kunin's work, the assessment is purpose-driven, highly contextualized, and based on local needs. Banerjee found that learners actually increased their topical knowledge about nutrition during the collaborative process of finding, sharing, and using knowledge to complete a task. So what this shows us is that when tests are designed to simulate an authentic learning experience, students actually show gains in knowledge about real world topics like nutrition. Thus, good assessment leads to student learning. Okay, almost done. So Banerjee's a a scenario task uh, that I just showed you, the task flow included reading, listening, and writing. So in a final example of scenario-based assessment, um, which I'm showing here, Unisong found that both topical knowledge and strategy use are part of the academic speaking construct. So this test is focused on academic speaking. 
Uh, and no, that's not Yuna. <laughs> that's just a picture <laughs> that matched my color scheme. Um, actually, it's from, it's from her test. Um, the, so the test scenario simulated an online intro to journalism class. And the test takers had to learn more about modern journalism through video materials pre presented by a virtual instructor. And then in the end, the goal of the scenario was for the test takers to orally present their perspective on the future of journalism in an online discussion forum, something that students might really do, right? Um, so to do this, they had to incorporate the information they had learned and obtained from the course materials um, introduced in the test. So um, what Song was able to find, and this is still being written up as far as I know, is that um, the test takers were able to gain topical knowledge related to the scenario topic, journalism, through the test experience. And for the, the advanced test takers, higher scores were found for coherence and organization and rhetorical control as well. So in other words, learning happened within the test. It's microgenesis. <laughs> I think that's so cool. <laughs> okay. All right, so all these exciting developments are encouraging. They remind us that good assessment improves student learning. And when it comes to learning, like writing or literacy, gathering and sharing knowledge in pursuing meaningful goals, we all know that it has the power to change people's lives. So in conclusion, assessment is so hard because it's important. And we are getting better at doing it validly, fairly, justly, and for learning. Thank you very much.